Thank you, Tigger. So I'm going to talk about the street, um, but first let's establish why this is important as a public space. The street is the most ubiquitous public space. It is the most pan-cultural public space, and that's particularly important when we're looking at uh, talking to the UN to uh, formulate sort of guidelines uh, that might be applicable across the globe. And the street has the potential to be a quintessential public space um, out of all other spaces and typologies. Uh, just like any other public space, the street has many benefits that we know of public space. Uh, but because streets are a network, inherently, they don't have to be necessarily made into a network, that they allow for very, very um, easy communication systems in our uh, cities and settlements, and they allow for easy possibilities of making things, um, uh, making policy changes such as movement or walkability. Um, streets are also important because in an urbanizing um, uh, sort of world, we know that cities are good for us, and what is particularly important in cities is the notion of proximity. Um, throughout time, that has been the one central reason why we've developed cities and people have gravitated to cities. And that proximity has led to, leads to two things, to access, to opportunity and services, and to encounter with people, people of all kinds, and ideas. That's sort of the central um, advantage, if you will, of the city. And if you look at any city, you can do this with your own city, map the streets and the space aside in two different colors, you see proximity, access, and encounter is easy as possible in, in the street as a network. But another reason why streets are important is that if you, for example, collapse all of the black blocks, which is public or private property, into one area and the streets into another, so not highways, just streets and alleys. In this case, this is a part of Cincinnati that I call home now. 42% of this this is streets. Uh, anywhere from over 25% to over 50% um, of area in cities is in streets. And of course, we know that there has been a legacy of um, sort of writing about the streets from Jane Jacobs, uh, Bernard Rudofsky, uh, Alan Jacobs, so on and so forth, that the image of a city, in fact, is often the image developed through the street. So in the context of future of places, or rather future of public uh, places or public spaces, thinking about the street is particularly important because it is such a large component that already exists in cities. And as I said, it's a pan-cultural resource uh, in, in our settlements across. The second thing I want to talk about is how we sense the street, or rather any public space. And that's important because we have to be kind of cognizant that there are both methods, both inductive as well as deductive methods that we need to apply to look at these um, public spaces, public spaces and public places. And there are advantages in doing that because in a, um, in a multicultural, uh, sort of very diverse city of today, we need uh, very, very diverse methods to understand the, the complexity that, that cities provide to us. So these methods have to be personal, they have to be engaged, and yes, they're very time consuming, uh, as you'll see. So this is an important point for us to, know, to note that we do not have any easy ways to understand public space, uh, and we need to put that effort in. What is, um, what is at hand is the fact that we have all these disciplines that have, in fact, very different but very rich methods. And we need to tap into this disciplinary sort of richness and be open-ended in terms of our methods to understand and sense uh, public places, public spaces, and streets in this context. So I'm gonna talk about uh, a public space that is at the uh, intersection of a parochial space of a neighborhood. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the neighborhood commercial street which um, has the possibility of being a social place, 
uh, but it also has the possibility of being so many other things as listed here. Uh, it is a place that can be the image of the neighborhood. It can be something that in fact um, becomes and, and uh, creates an identity for the neighborhood. And it could be something that can make the neighborhood and the city legible. So the, the biggest competitive advantage of a neighborhood commercial street is the fact that you know, it is a place where people can just on their daily round uh, encounter others as a part of just sort of doing their um, everyday services, they can encounter other people. Uh, it's a place of easy access for all, being at the, um, at the edge or within a neighborhood. It is a place that is easily accessible to people with limited mobility, uh, whether it is because of economic reasons or physical reasons or health reasons. Uh, it's also an interesting place, a public space, which is in transition um, where what I call the, the neighborhood meets the city and the citizen, uh, the, the neighborhood resident becomes a citizen of the city. This is particularly valuable in the case of children, as you'll see in a little bit. So I'm going to talk about three streets in the Boston metropolitan area and they all are in the same context. They're connected to the same transportation system. They are near universities. They have sort of similar conditions and yet they're quite different. Uh, in where they are. So the first thing is to look at what these streets are, what happens here. Are there anything, any social, uh, are there social spaces at all? Uh, and it's important to note that all these pictures, um, and I'll show you a lot of these, are taken on only these three streets. This is not an idea of collecting pictures from around the world and hoping that this could be uh, a street or a neighborhood commercial street. Anything that you see here is taken on these three streets. So these are places to gather and meet for people who are from different backgrounds, um, have different reasons to be on the street. It's a place um, much like you know an outdoor living room for you to relax. Uh, it's a place to learn. It's a place to learn social skills, particularly for children. Uh, it's a place to learn how to negotiate the environment. Again, the transitional first public space in the neighborhood. It's a place to learn and teach. Uh, it's a place to learn about nature, to learn about what goes on, different uses and activities. Um, it's a place for discussion and dialogue. Uh, again, all this is happening on these three streets in a very uh, short time, within, within about a year. Uh, it's a place to learn how to cooperate and how to be creative. Um, it's a place to learn about participation and to learn about your civic responsibilities, duties, and rights. Um, and it's a place to be exposed to people who are unlike yourself, to learn about empathy. It's a place where you um, uh, learn to sort of accept or know the other. Uh, it's a place to play and explore. And, uh, some of these are my favorite pictures here where this child who's probably under two years old, um, thinks of these cluttered, perhaps even ugly, newspaper, magazine dispensing boxes as a little playground because every one that he opens is hinged in a different place, mm -hmm. is a different material. When he lets the handle go, it makes a different sound. Uh, sometimes he finds things inside it which are fun and colorful, and if he picks them and throws them out, he knows his father comes running, so it's really, really fun for this kid. Uh, this one, of course, looks at this object, this artifact, uh, not for what we thought we might use it for, uh, but to do everything else other than sitting. <laughs> but it's also a place for play for, for adults. Uh, it's a place for information, whether it's just information about the neighborhood, or it's an information about a campaign within the neighborhood, or in the city, it's a place for expression whether it's at um, um, Halloween time or it might be some local artist trying to display something on a very ordinary store uh, show window. It's a place for you know, sensory stimulus that's important for us in, in an everyday sort of life, to see things, to listen to things, to smell things, uh, and to engage in the environment in a very sensory way. Um, so in sensing this, this space, I, um, again, look at uh, literature and sociology, and I find that there are these three ways to classify 
the social um, behaviors that are visible on the street. There's passive sociability, which is being alone together, so uh, which is really being in the public, but not be bothered by others. And there's fleeting sociability and enduring sociability. So uh, passive sociability, you know, things like public solitude, spectating and display, uh, relaxation and play, that you might be able to see, you know, some of these slides. Uh, fleeting sociability is just a simple waver or nod uh, to an acquaintance or a neighbor, a momentary stop for a chat, maybe asking somebody for time, although we don't need to do that very, very much anymore because of our phones. Uh, play and even triangulation, what White called triangulation, that might happen through an event or even a mishap where people might exchange uh, sort of fleeting uh, interactions. And enduring sociability, which uh, might be intimate relationships and affiliations that may be planned gatherings or regular meetings in a place. Uh, all of these are slightly different sort of ways or behaviors of sociability that all occur. And there is literature that talks about weak ties, perhaps even becoming stronger ties. Uh, and that's, this is part of that, uh, that idea. Um, so the question here is, how do we measure this? and can we measure it, and what are the ways I talked about all the, the different methods that can be used, and I'm particularly interested in looking at uh, and trying out different methods <coughs> to understand and measure sociability. So this is the way I created this sociability index, where I'm interested in looking at people who are staying at the street. Not the people who are walking by, but people who are there either alone or in, uh, in dyads, triads, or in a group, and how long they stay. So those are the three sort of variables, components, that make uh, the, the sociability index, if you will. So um, the three streets here are drawn in a plan elevation combination. Appleyard did this very well, borrowed from him. But the idea is that every dot that you see here is a person. And these are 30 different walk-bys. If anybody's interested in detailed methodology, it's been written about. I can tell you. I can give you uh, details on that. And it's also being tested in different places to see how this really works and whether it's robust or not. Yeah. So the, um, each dot here is a person, and these are 30 walk-bys done from early morning on weekdays till 11 o'clock at night uh, on weekdays and weeknights. Obviously, we see that on these three streets, there are some places where there are more people uh, compared to other places. So some of you might say that, well, I know the answer. It's not rocket science. This is where there are cafes, there are restaurants. And yes, there is anecdotal information. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of good knowledge. There's commonsensical knowledge. But there's other things as well, which get teased out when we apply multiple methods um, in, this, in this kind of research. So um, if we just collectively put them together, we see how the differences of those dots that you are seeing in the three streets. This is a chart that is putting all of these little segments into one chart, and you find the difference of where people are and where they are not. Now, remember, all these streets have the same um, sort of larger scale advantage of transportation and disadvantage of being near a busy street with vehicles, with parking or not enough parking, being near a university, allowing for more people, so on and so forth. So there is a level of uh, equality in terms of what they are in the context that they are in. And yet there are these differences. These are the differences in the duration um, at, of uh, how long people stay at these places. The darker is the longer time frame. Um, and then, of course, there are, uh, there are attitudes um, and there are feelings of people that are important to know. So asking people things like, what brings you here? Do you use this location more than others? Uh, compared, do you use, use this block uh, more? If yes, why? And then you collect all that information. If not, why not? So on and so forth. Um, you look at what are the three most important things about the block that you would not want to change, things you would like to change or add. So you develop these through interviews and surveys that are, it's again, very, very painstaking. It's very time consuming. Um, and then you look at this and study how people create territories and how territories expand and what do businesses do to either help people with those territories or otherwise. So I won't go into details of, of all this because this is a pretty 
sort of uh, laborious methods to, to study this, but so on and so forth. And then you try and understand, this is an important point for urban designers in the room, that we talk about the street as an enclosure and a space. It's almost impossible to do in a new city, in American cities. You have to think about the street as, a, as pieces of streets, that in fact, there are two potential wonderfully enclosed streets on one street. This is on Mass Ave which in itself is not a particularly wonderful street. But if you look at the edges, they in fact create uh, very nice streets, neighborhood commercial streets on each of the edges. Um, understanding it, going there, drawing the street, trying to see what's going on, um, what are the qualities of the streets um, as spaces. Anyway, so looking at the literature from Site to Lynch, Gordon Cullen, Jacobs, William White, Gale, all of that, there's all of this knowledge that is there. Um, I teased out 11 variables that we can in fact use statistical methods, sort of quasi-soft statistical methods like simple regressions and factor analyses to try and get this information teased out. And the five that you see with orange um, dots next to them hold up in the regression analysis. So it's you know kind of obvious, stride walk width, seating, William White said people will sit where there is places to sit. So kind of obvious. Um, but there are other things that come up, you know, the personalization of the, of the building facade of the edge, uh, or community places, or third places, in Oldenburg's term. And these are not things that are determined by me as an external observer, but these are things that are determined by people who define different third places depending on what their attachment to that place is. In any case, then we can uh, cluster these and see does they make any sense and does it come together in ways that we can understand and contribute to the knowledge base. And the, the idea that these are in fact qualities of form, these are qualities of activity and land use if you will, and they're also sort of qualities that are of pure meaning to people in terms of attachment that um, makes this sociability possible. But all sociability is not equal. So we can, if we think about people hanging out in streets, that can be just done through the idea of consumption of space. All you're doing is consuming space. You're eating, drinking, buying, you know, you can create social activity through that and sociable streets through that. But, but you can also create a space that is productive, where people are actually doing things, they're engaging, they're making, they're, you know, they're, it's, it's, a, it's a balance between the production of space and the consumption of space. And, um, and these are, there are differences between these three locations, that there are places that are more um, sort of balanced, imbalanced with consumption versus otherwise. And, if you, and all, of, all of this is doable as long as we have the time and energy to do it, that you try to map this idea that many things can coexist, uh, social, economic, leisure, political, all these kinds of and survival activities can in fact happen. And the two key words here, um, and many, many groups can coexist, um, groups that might be seemingly disparate in terms of mothers with infants and panhandlers and homeless and so on and so forth, but they can, in, they can coexist with two words in, in mind, time and space. So there are, even on very short, simple, small blocks, there are different spaces that can be occupied, that are occupied by different groups, or there are different time at which different groups occupy that space. So this notion that the space has to be monocultural is in fact something that we've created out of fear and the notion of safety, which is I think overhyped. We don't necessarily need safety all the time. Um, yes, we need places to be safe, but we don't need to be hyper about that. And so multiple groups can coexist, uh, as, as we see here among these. And sociability can be rich, just, and robust when there are all of these activities that occur. Political activities, economic activities, activities of survival, because these create very different kinds of sociability uh, that really, really make it a very robust. So how do we do this uh, out of all that regression and you know, qualitative, quantitative studies? Here are seven things. Uh, I, I have elaboration on this and elaboration on that elaboration in the book. I won't bore you with that. Uh, I'm, I like guidelines, but I'm not a big fan of prescriptive guidelines because there has to be some 
overarching framework that might be provided, but then there has to be interpretation that has to be contextual. And we've heard that in this conference a lot, um, particularly if we're going to talk about something that would, be, would become a global kind of guideline. In any case, so even for these streets, there are these guidelines which have a fair amount of details within that I think we may not have time to go into. But what I want to um, get into is something that's um, particularly important here in terms of what are our meta strategies then in thinking about uh, public spaces or streets. And I want to pick up on a couple things here, this idea in ecological thinking that talks about health of systems. And if we think of public spaces or streets as systems, it doesn't in fact work through competition. It in fact works through coexistence. And there are multiple interconnected systems that are both stable and unstable. Things that are forming, things that are dying, and things that are sort of in a stable equilibrium. But not everything is in an equilibrium. There are always things in flux. It's a very open-ended system. And most importantly, there is conflict. Conflict is not a problem. Conflict is something that is a result of many different things, using the space, occupying it, and in fact, it is managed through distribution and diffusion. Now, this is mostly things that ecologists talk about, and good ecologies deal with conflict in this way. This has actually some very useful things for us to think about in public space, where conflict can be managed through external frameworks that might help vulnerable populations, but also help design uh, spaces or manage spaces through that can work, uh, work out conflict through distribution and diffusion. So this is something that's actually um, things that we might find in a street in India. Again, obviously we don't have time to, to, be, to get into details here, but what goes on in a street here? Many of you are thinking, what's the connection between the street in India and the streets that you showed us in the Boston metropolitan area? The idea, and there are cultural differences, obviously. The idea is not to transport one sort of notion from here to there, but the idea is to understand how this works as, a, as such a sort of robust and diverse system. And, you know, as you might notice that there is everything that goes on here, uh, there's socializing, there's making, mending, washing, drying, cooking, preaching, praying, the, and so on. Importantly, the workings of the neighborhood are visible on the street in India. And it's a real place of communication, exchange, and leisure, and almost everything. So what would we have to do to make the street a social place? By looking at all those things that I talked about, it has to be understood as a place of interchange for access, travel, commerce, leisure, sociability, and survival. Uh, it has to be both a path and a place not just a path, which is what we consider streets to be. Um, the idea of coexistence of different people, activities, and forms has to be accepted and sort of supported in what we do. The idea of localized controls that, have, that work through negotiation that are required at that particular time. Not all of these will be known, but the, the idea that there will be negotiations that will happen between the different users and there have to be myriad governance systems, not just systems that are governing transport or economic transactions, but social and cultural transactions as well. Um, so we look at the way that, uh, these are the last couple of slides. Um, for centuries, we, we managed problems through the idea of simplicity. This is a paper by Warren Weaver looking at complexity over time. and. Uh, at the time, when we thought about things with simple variables, this is a problem, it's one problem, we'll solve it. The street, in fact, was a very complex and multi-dimensional space, often chaotic, not equal, but uh, multi-dimensional. In the 20th century, we started to look at things, we knew that there were multiple things that affected uh, certain uh, behavior or phenomena, but we, we did not yet mature to understand that things are interrelated as we do now. In the 20th century, what uh, uh, Richard Sennett talked about yesterday through the Charter of Essence, but also through garden cities, as well as broad acre cities, these big ideas about cities, we created homogenous and monocultural spaces. 
in today's multicultural heterogeneous city where we understand complexity as something that is can be organized uh, and something that's a good thing we need to think about the street as a multicultural connected complex and heterogeneous space the final slide um, again for those of you who are urban designers here in the traditional typo typological taxonomy street has always been understood as a as a path as a place of movement and we have uh, these very dis very definite places of gathering and stationary activities <coughs> the plazas and the squares and the parks and in my mind that's a big barrier to thinking about the street as a place a, a space which is public which is a huge percentage of the city not just of public space we need to change that and no amount of guidelines can create social public spaces if we first don't believe in the street as a place. Thank you.